Hello, my name is Paul West, and I'd like to welcome you to our second in our series of summer uh, workshops on atomic force microscope techniques. Um, this, this talk is about sample preparation, and uh, t one of the presenters today will be Peter Eaton, he's sitting next to me here. He's from the University of Porto, and morning. he'll be, good morning, yeah, and he'll be talking about uh, sample preparation. So today, we'll go through the basics of AFM sample preparation. Uh, we'll talk about sample preparation for nanotechnology samples, and then we'll talk about uh, sample preparation for life sciences samples. So here are some of the basics. Uh, the first one is that the sample must be clean. Um, in, in an atomic force microscope, as you're aware, the needle must come down and scan over the surface. If there's a fingerprint on the surface, or if the surface has been laying around in a dusty environment for a long time, the needle would have to go through that contamination layer before you could image the sample surface. So it's very important that the sample is clean. Secondly, the sample must be mounted solidly in the microscope. Um, if the sample is not mounted solidly in the, mi solidly in the microscope, it can vibrate and um, add unwanted noise to the images. Third, and this is very important, the sample you want to image must be adhered to the surface and not to the probe. What I mean here is that if you have something on the sample <coughs> surface and that something wants to stick to the probe more than the surface, it'll, it'll just be pushed around the sample with the probe and you won't see anything. Um, I've seen this happen a lot with different kinds of biomolecules which end up being just stuck to the probe. Okay, finally, something that's very helpful is the sample and the probe must be grounded. Um, electrostatic charge between the, on the probe can be very, can make running the microscope very, very difficult. So, um, in most of the microscopes, the probe is already grounded, so it can be important to make sure the sample is grounded. At this point, I'm going to turn the presentation, the webinar, over to Peter Eaton, my colleague here, to uh, continue. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, the takeaway message from this uh, talk sh should be that there are various uh, tips that we'll give you, but that in general, AFM sample preparation is very simple. Uh, and so that means, for example, some samples will require no preparation. So for example, um, a polymer film, or a solid art, um, a, a metal film, or um, a piece of a manufactured article, you may just need to um, fix it into the microscope and start scanning. One of the most common types of, part, uh, uh, of samples that people want to prepare are particulate samples, by which I mean any sample where you have something in a solution, uh, some particles flo floating around like nanoparticles, or even um, a cell suspension, or biomolecules in a, in a solution. And if you have uh, particulate samples, typically you just deposit those onto a, a, a substrate uh, and then allow that drop of liquid to dry. Um, but if you do that, there are two things that you should think carefully about. First of all, the nature of the substrate you're going to use and the nature of the solvent or dispersant that you're going to use. So first of all, I'll talk about the different substrates in AFM. Uh, and the, probably the most commonly used substrate in AFM is mica. So it's a, it's a aluminosilicate. And most importantly, it's a layered material that we can cleave, we can separate different layers to reveal uh, a clean surface uh, that we can then use to deposit the sample. Uh, it's also low cost and you can see atomic steps on the materials sometimes. Um, typically mica has negative charge and um, there are methods to uh, change over to uh, positive charges on the surface uh, if that's required to help your sample to adhere. Um, and some recipes for that, sorry, some recipes for that are listed in the, the book, Atomic Force Microscopy, which you can win later on, or you can buy, of course. Um, and if you look at research papers, often people talk about freshly cleaved mica. So what that means is um, you'll cleave the mica, you'll, you'll prepare a super clean surface, and you'll use it straight away. And as I said, this is probably the most commonly used substrate in AFM. Now, uh, here's an image of just some nanoparticles on, uh, on a mica surface. So the mica is this, uh, this purple in the background. Uh, and you can see there's no real features there. The sample looks very clean. So if I showed you an image just of mica with nothing on it, you basically see nothing. Peter, was that measured on the TTAFM? That was measured on the TTAFM, Paul. Yes, that's right. 
so how do we do this cleaving? This is a technique that, that uh, a lot of AFM users need to learn. So we have here, we'll prepare the, the um, <coughs> substrate first of all by just mounting mica, which is this layered material here, with some adhesive onto a metal disc. And then, in some way, you cleave the top layers of the mica off and throw them away, uh, which will leave you um, a super clean surface here for you to deposit your sample on. And that uh, cleaving motion action can be done either with um, uh, a razor scalpel, but they must be super clean, or you can just take a piece of uh, sticky tape or scotch tape, uh, stick it onto the surface and then pull it off and it will pull off some layers of the mica, uh, leaving you a clean surface. The second substrate um, that I'm going to talk about is related to, to mica in the fact that it's also a layered material. It's HOPG, um, which is highly oriented pyrolytic graphite, uh, which is a form of carbon. Um, it's a type of, of graphite, basically, which, which forms, again, uh, atomic layers. So, like mica, it can form atomically flat terraces. Uh, unlike mica, it's hydrophobic, uh, which makes it a bit more difficult to use with um, uh, suspensions in water, um, but it can be used for conducting modes. Now, with mica, if we, if we uh, cleave mica well, we can get areas of hundreds or at least tens of uh, square microns that are um, uh, atomically flat, whereas with HLPG typically it cleaves more easily so you get more atomic steps. So here's an image of HLPG, again measured on the TTAFM, um, and you can see these steps here, and so some of these steps, these small steps around here, are basically one carbon atom, one uh, atomic layer high. Um, the next substrate is silicon. Uh, silicon can be extremely flat, of course, Although if you're using it in air, and a lot of AFM is done in air, um, you will get a silicon dioxide layer, which means that it will not be uh, atomically flat. Um, but it will have a, a distinctive pattern, which I'll show you later. And it's typically used for um, conductive um, methods. Um, and so if, if you, you're not using it just in a clean room, under strictly controlled uh, conditions, you may need to clean it, but typically uh, you'll just use a, uh, uh, a piece of silicon that has been kept clean. Um, so here's an image, I think this, this image comes from you, Paul. Um, what are these structures on top of the silicon? Uh, those are one nanometer and three nanometer nanoparticles. Okay, yeah, so these are quantum dot structures. These, these, this is, I think, is one of the one nanometer and this is one of the three nanometers, and the background is the silicon, so in the silicon, we have a, a sort of a ripple pattern. And so this is the, the typical structure of the silicon. And although this is, this is uh, silicon oxide, di dioxide, um, and so it has some, uh, it has some structure, uh, the structure is not enough to cover up these one nanometer nanoparticles, so it can still be used for, um, for looking at really small things. Now, if you're looking at um, biological materials, typically you'll want to use um, glass. Uh, glass is not as flat, it's nowhere near as flat as mica or HLPG, uh, and it's not as flat as uh, silicon typically. Um, but if you're using cells, this is not important. So typically for cells, we will use glass, um, and normally you will um, just have to clean the glass with perhaps some detergent and water. So here's an image of some bacteria. The height of these cells is about um, half a micron. Uh, so you don't see uh, the, the roughness of the glass. So for, the, for these sort of uh, large samples, uh, it doesn't really matter if the, if the substrate isn't so, uh, so smooth. Um, but if you're using biomolecules, um, even though they may adhere to the glass, the roughness will disguise them. Um, so the next thing to, dis uh, to consider is your solvent or your dispersant. And in principle, you can use anything for AFM, it doesn't really matter. Um, the most important thing is you keep it clean, which means that you have in there, if you, if you can manage it, only the sample that you want to see. Now, why do you need to keep it clean? Well, the reason is that everything that you have in your droplet of liquid that you, you deposit on the substrate uh, will go onto the substrate and will dry onto the substrate and will be greatly concentrated as the drying occurs. And so particle concentration will increase uh, while you're drying and salt concentration will, will increase, uh, pH could change, 
and you have these meniscus effects. So you have effects such as uh, aggregation um, and movement of material towards the edge of the droplet uh, during drying. Now, the most common uh, solvent or dispersant used in uh, AFM is, of course, water, and the quality of the water um, will affect the results. So here we have an image of uh, um, basically a, a mica substrate with some tap water dried on it, and we have lots of structures here, of course. Then we have here some filtered water. This is filtered, this is much cleaner than the tap water, but you can see that there are still some particles here. Um, so there'll now just be a few um, specific points about uh, sample preparation in, first of all, the life sciences, and then secondly, in nanotechnology. Um, so in the life sciences, the two uh, things that I'll really discuss are biomolecules and cells. So for biomolecules such as DNA and proteins, you are go going to need an, to use an atomically flat substrate. And typically, you, there will have to be some uh, mechanism for those to be bound onto the surface, even if it's just gently. Uh, so there are, there are some uh, recipes and some specific protocols to do this that are discussed in, I think, Chapter 4 of our book, Atomic Force Microscopy. Um, if you have cells growing on cover slips, you won't need to do any binding. You may need to do a, a little wash to remove salts. Um, if, however, you have cells in suspension and you want those to be deposited on a surface, in many cases you will need to modify the glass such that those cells uh, adhere to the surface. So in those, in those cases, again, you can look in the book and look for some recipes to uh, increase the adhesion between cells and your glass surface. In nanotechnology, the two areas that we'll briefly discuss are nanoparticles and nanotubes. Um, so these are the very common samples in AFM, both very easy to image with AFM. And uh, if you have water-soluble nanoparticles, all you have to do is, as I mentioned previously, um, dry a droplet of them onto mica. Now you have to look at issues whether they will agglomerate uh, and take control of those sort of things, but this is a simple preparation method and probably the first one you would take, you would try. The problems will be if they're not water soluble, if they do aggregate, or if they move around. So again, you'll need to look at uh, binding uh, materials onto the surface, um, th those nanoparticles onto the surface, and then washing them. In the case of nanotubes, the, the, the best way, if you can do it, is to actually uh, grow the nanotubes from the substrate, and they'll definitely stay there in that case. Um, the most commonly seen um, examined nanotubes are uh, carbon nanotubes, CNTs, they will normally clump together before the deposition and they may move around with the tip if you just do, if you just spread them on the surface. So typically uh, the way to solve that is to disperse them with some sort of detergent and then deposit using the techniques mentioned before. So finally to conclude, uh, sample preparation for AFM I think is a rel relatively simple but it's something you need to think about uh, because it will always improve your results if you do a good sample preparation. Okay, um, do we have any questions on the chat line? Okay, so the, the question is related to uh, immobilizing, I think, uh, iron oxide particles um, for contact mode imaging. Um, well, it depends what uh, substrate you have them in, but for that sort of sample, you can use the, the standard technique, which is really just uh, depositing from your um, solution and they're quite large so you don't need to worry too much about uh, contamination um, but if you're going to do contact mode imaging um, it may be it may be that they move around a little bit you may be better off using vibrating mode for that um, but I as a first guess I would just uh, deposit a drop droplet of them and see um, see how it goes okay the question is, how do you know if the sample probe is not grounded? And uh, typically what will happen is when you're doing tip approach, you'll see the cantilever bending uh, uh, before it gets to the surface. The electrostatic forces are long-range forces, and they can affect the uh, bending of the probe as much as uh, 100 microns from the surface. So you can just test that there's a path between them by, with a multimeter. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Right? Yeah, that's a good way to start, yeah. But if you want to see a bilayer of lipids, um, that's uh, very easy to, to, to see by AFM, and the easiest way to do it is simply uh, deposit some vesicles on um, freshly cleaved mica, leave it to uh, the, the vesicles to spread for about 20 minutes, and then wash it with clean water, and then add the solution you're going to image them in.
or if you're going to do it in air, just be very careful with the washing. Okay, so the question is how do you prepare tissue for force measurements? And um, I don't think we have an answer for that right now. Um, I, I would think that if you, if you have a, a solid piece of tissue, um, basically you just need to bind it down and you should be able to, you should be able to um, do force measurements, measurements on it without any further um, preparation. I think it should be simple. I don't think you need to do anything special for that. You don't want to, what you want to avoid in that case is um, any kind of fixatives because the, one of the advantages of AFM for this sort of measurement is that you don't need to fix the, the, the sample at all compared to, uh, unlike, for example, electron microscopy. So because you want to do uh, force measurements, the best thing is, is not to do any fixing and obviously just keep the tissue in the most um, realistic conditions you can. In other words, don't let it dry out. The question was um, how to mark a spot on an AFM surface uh, to return to later. Well, um, you need to use the video microscope to, to uh, to really uh, record an image of that area with some distinguishing feature. What you, um, apart from that, there isn't much you can do. I, I've seen people in the past just take a sharpie and draw a circle around what, where they were. Yeah, as a, as a rough way, that's one way you can start. You can actually get some substrates um, which actually have like a grid pattern on them. You could, for example, have um, if you're looking at a, a clear sub a clear substrate underneath it, you could have a metal disc with some um, some scratches with numbers on them. Those can actually be purchased. Um, and so, if you start out with something that's got some 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 clear signs on it that you can use to to um, to to identify the area, just record an image with a video microscope with the cantilever right next to the um, the area you want to go to and use that to, to navigate back. We, the question was about um, conducting uh, techniques, right? Conducting AFM, okay. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, yeah, using some sort of a conductive AFM technique, CAFM. Um, to do that, you have to have a conductive substrate. So yeah. HOPG works for that, is that correct? Yeah, well, you, could, uh, you could use silicon as well. Silicon as well, yeah, well, that's right, with the coating on it. Okay, so again, we have another question related to the uh, iron oxide uh, nanoparticles. You can use uh, any so any solvent for a for AFM for deposition of samples for AFM. If they are soluble in uh, water, use water because it's easier. Then you can deposit them on on mica without any difficulty. If you have them um, already dissolved in, for for example, hexane or an organic solvent like that. The difficulty you'll have, th there's no reason you can't do it, but the difficulty you'll have is that when you deposit a droplet of that on, uh, for example, mica, a very hydrophilic substrate like that, um, the, the droplet will tend to run off the surface. And so you won't, you'll lose a lot of the material, but you'll still have some left on the surface. Um, if you can disperse them in water, that's the best way to do it. Yes, we have uh, five nanometer silver nanoparticles, and the question is, can we scan this using the TTAFM? I found it was very difficult to go down 10 nanometers or less. Well, um, that's funny you should ask that, because I have actually used the TTAFM to scan five nanometer silver nanoparticles. Uh, so if you're having some difficulties with that, um, then perhaps you could... Um, you could um, contact AFM Workshop and, and uh, describe the problems you're having. Basically, if you're having difficulty with really small um, nanoparticles, you need to ensure that your instrument uh, is in the highest resolution mode that it has. You need to reduce all sources of noise. Typically, if, if you're having difficulty with um, uh, going below 10 nanometers, it means you've got a lot of noise in your image, or you have a very blunt probe. So keep the, the probe sharp and reduce all sources of noise, such as acoustic noise, make sure you have a good vibration isolation system. How to prevent nanoparticles from moving in contact mode scanning? Well, um, what's, what's, what's happening there is that the uh, nanoparticles are not really adhering to the surface, so um, you, need to, you need to look at what's the interaction between those and the surface. Um, for contact mode scanning, you do need to be sure that the, the things are staying down there. 
So you need to reduce uh, imaging forces and make sure that your, your feedback gains are as high as possible. What mode is better for lipids, contact mode or tapping mode? Well, that depends what you want to see and how you want to scan them. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, contact mode is um, a technique that definitely can be used for uh, lipid bilayers, if that's what, you, that's what the question's about. Um, and especially in liquid, contact mode can give more reliable height information. On the other hand, if you're using an oscillating mode, such as um, vibrating mode, or um, as described here, tapping mode, then, um, then it may be easier, but you may have less quantitative information from that technique. Well, thank you for all those great questions. Um, if you want to do some uh, follow-up, you can write them to info at afmworkshop.com. We try to make these uh, presentations available to people that request them. Um, again, thank you for coming to our webinar, and uh, Peter and I are both very happy that uh, you attended. Thank you.